And welcome back to a fresh episode of the Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And if you haven't yet, check out our weekly email where we share actual marketing tips, useful podcasts, free guides, bonus resources, and much, much more every Monday to start your week off with a bang. You can sign up over at businessgrowth.email. And with that said, my guest today is Justin Rowe. Justin is the founder and CMO over at Impactable.com, a LinkedIn ads agency. Justin, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? Hey, it's going pretty well. Thanks for having me on here. No worries, dude. Looking forward to chatting. We're going to be talking all things LinkedIn ads and if they are really worth it for businesses to get stuck into, invest, and start generating revenue. So with that said... Justin, LinkedIn ads have a notorious reputation for being way too expensive compared to other ad channels. So are they really worth it in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, that's that's usually the 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 rep that they get and probably one of the lines that I hear the most. And they are I mean, I I can't deny they are expensive um, and it really depends on the way you look at it. Um, Mm. For me, I think most people are comparing it to. Facebook ads, which right. or to Google ads, which is a really unfair comparison sure. um, because Facebook ads, number one, it's a, a, it's a lot larger audience that you can market to. Their algorithm is a little bit more advanced. So they, yep. they, they sift the data and find potential buyers um, a little more easily than, um, than LinkedIn can, but Facebook is mostly, or is more geared towards the B2C. Whereas LinkedIn is the largest professional network uh, that exists and it's geared more towards B2B. So I would argue that the quality of the traffic that you get from LinkedIn is a higher quality and worth the higher price per per click. Um, and the other thing that I would say about that is usually what we what we have is people are like, oh, the cost per click is this, the the cost per lead is this. And then I start asking about the quality. Okay, well, how many of those Facebook leads turn into booked calls that turn into, and then, oh, well, you know, we're, we're getting these leads and we're nurturing them and we don't quite, but when we get a a lead from, from LinkedIn, like they actually book calls at a higher rate and those booked calls actually close at a higher rate and they actually spend more money with us um, than the leads that, you know, we and a lot of other B2B businesses were getting from Facebook. So I would say to answer that question, don't look at the cost per click. Don't look at the cost per lead. LinkedIn will lose on that. I'll be the first to tell you. Look at the show up rate, the the cost per actual booked call. And if you can track it, the cost per, you know, getting an actual client to close the business. And that takes a lot more time and effort and tracking to pull that off. But in almost all the cases I've seen, um, that's a a much better win uh, and going with LinkedIn for that traffic. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? I mean, there's there's no point investing a ton of money. So if you are looking at Facebook, like you say, you quite rightly might get a ton more leads, but you might find that the quality of those leads is much poorer. It might be a cheaper cost per click, a cheaper pos- cost per lead acquisition, but then perhaps those clients convert into smaller deals or they don't even convert into to sales one deals in the end. Um, whereas LinkedIn, like you say, is perhaps a higher cost per click because it's a dedicated B2B business platform. Perhaps that's why it's got the edge. Have you ever seen a B2C company do well on LinkedIn ads out of curiosity? Um, it comes down to their price point after that. So if if the product you're selling is 20, 30, I mean, it, it's, it, it would be really terrible for probably e-com. Now, if mm. it's a consumer product, that has a high value or a high lifetime value of three, 4,000, or if you're selling a high ticket, you know, even coaching item that could right. be B2C, but um, the price tag makes it worth it. That would be probably the best case for B2C. But if your product is under $2,000, I would say it is highly unlikely or be really hard to carve out a profitable channel on LinkedIn. Yeah. For and- that one. No, that makes sense. I mean, I guess because the cost per click is going to be X as a starting rate, if your product price is less than that, it just doesn't make sense on the back end to to kind of go in with that. Well, and I I would say for both of those first two about LinkedIn being more expensive or maybe it working for B2C, 
the, yeah. the one thing I also push for people is if nothing else, like all of that stigma is LinkedIn cold traffic. If, if that's, that's the most expensive carving out LinkedIn cold traffic to convert into retargeting. But even if, even if that's not going to work for you, or if you want to start in a budget at the very least, you should be retargeting your website traffic, your qualified website traffic with LinkedIn retargeting ads, because whether you're running Google or you have an e-com store or you're, you know, running Facebook ads, if that does work for you, it's not like, can LinkedIn do better than that? You should also just think of it as can LinkedIn enhance those other channels. If I'm spending $50 for a Google click that's, uh, you know, for the traffic best LinkedIn ads agency, like, and I do spend 30, 40, $50 for that click, I then would run LinkedIn ads to retarget that traffic for the next 90 days and have a higher chance of that click converting. So it's also an enhancer and not just, you know, a standalone channel. Yeah, and we'll get into that in a bit in terms of some best practices and what you should look to have in place before you go into LinkedIn ads, some hints and tips around setting those up. And like you mentioned, quite rightly retargeting any existing traffic you can make some good use of. Are there any businesses that you found are typically very, very successful in LinkedIn ads? And are there any businesses that perhaps shouldn't consider it from your experience? It um, some of the some of the most successful ones. It comes down to um, and some of the initial questions I might ask people is what other ad channels are you running? Um, and right. that's a that's a huge factor because if people are looking at LinkedIn, I think the the fit that's the poorest quality for LinkedIn ads is if you're not running any other paid traffic to your website, you don't have a ton of quality organic traffic to your website, and you think LinkedIn would be a great place to start your paid advertising journey. That's probably one of the more painful ones. Um, and it would take, I don't know, it might take six months, depending on your budget, um, to carve out a profitable channel if that is your main source of cold traffic. So I would say companies that have a healthy traffic flow to their website, preferably other, um, other channels, companies that have a high lifetime value for a client. I mean, probably our, our best ones are you know, the ones that if it's $10,000 or above lifetime value, I mean, they find it to be a pretty easy win um, for for LinkedIn. And probably the lowest fits are, yeah, if they're not running any other traffic, they don't have like an established, um, you know, maybe they don't even know exactly who their target audience is, or they don't quite have the product market fit yet. And so again, they're they're trying to carve this out. And they're also just trying to learn more about their business. That makes it even harder for, for them to learn. But the companies that have the other ad channels, not only do they have the quality traffic we can retarget, but they also tend to have more data that we can leverage to hone in faster um, on on that target demographic that's going to convert higher. Yeah, some some interesting points. So like you said, perhaps LinkedIn ads shouldn't be considered as one of the first marketing strategies that a business gets stuck into. I guess because if you look at, and I'm naturally going to say this because I sell websites, <laughs> SEO and Google ads, yeah. but if you look at high intent channels, so if you needed, I don't know, help with the software as a solution, service fast, maybe you need some accounting software for your business because your accounting software is really old, doesn't work very well and is perhaps out of date. You might literally type into Google accounting software or best accounting so software provider, click a Google ad or click an organic listing, go to that company or go to a couple companies, request a demo and then go with one of them. Um, which is yeah. obviously quite a high intent way of getting the job done. A lot of website or a lot of companies, I guess, look as to a first port of call. So are you saying kind of put these things into place, get the quick wins with these with organic traffic with Google ads and such, and then look to let, look to enhance that with LinkedIn ads, whereby you might be targeting more colder traffic, yeah. albeit perhaps retargeting from your website or albeit targeting a new persona fresh on LinkedIn but already have those things in play before you consider LinkedIn ads. Yeah. And I will, I will never knock Google ads. Um, I really believe that most companies and most startups and businesses should probably look to Google ads before they come to LinkedIn. And because exactly what you said, I mean, we run a LinkedIn ads agency. So there are people searching almost daily for LinkedIn ads agency, LinkedIn ads company, a company to run my LinkedIn ads um, and showing up for those people because they're actively searching for the exact solution that you sell. That is 
probably the best place to step in front of traffic. Whereas running, carving out a cold channel, they haven't asked for you. You don't know that they're searching for it. You don't necessarily, you know, have any intent signals that they need it or are interested in it. You're building a group of people that are most likely to have a need, putting ads that hopefully get their attention, then tracking those intent signals by people that visited your website and meet that criteria and retargeting them. But it's a longer funnel. It costs, you know, more money. But again, I would come back to pay, go to Google, target the people that are searching for exactly what you do, and then retarget them on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a different animal, Google versus cold LinkedIn channel. Um, and Google's a great place to start. Yeah, that's fair. I suppose the one advantage about LinkedIn is that you've got all the additional data though that you don't have with Google. So you've got which you can share better than I can, but in terms of what you can leverage from real specific buyer personas. So perhaps you're going after, I don't know, marketing directors, CMOs, uh, companies with 200 plus staff in tech organization. Perhaps you're going after SaaS organizations in the US and certain states. So you can really drill down to that. Whereas Google, you're literally opening it up to your target search terms. Um, and on the basis that your website then shows if you've done your SEO or if you've done your Google ads. So it's a lot broader, right? less drilled in yeah and i would say google i mean google has its limits because it's based on the search volume of people that are searching for that in the you know geographies that you serve so i would say you know usually you would start there harness and capture the demand that's already out there and then you know carving out cold channels is kind of about creating that demand that uh, and they they again they'll play off each other like the linkedin ads that i run that get people thinking about LinkedIn ads, they then take to Google and type in best LinkedIn ads agencies or best Google ad agency. And then, you know, you'd want to show up um, there to capture that demand that your cold ads generated. So it also works uh, in reverse that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So back and forth. And on that note, are there any other things that a company should look to have in place as well before they kick off a LinkedIn campaign? Yeah, the, the biggest one would be, and I think I've been I've been harping on this a lot lately on LinkedIn, is your your tracking and, and retargeting pixels and your conversion tracking. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen even really big companies who have really healthy spend, you know, they're spending ten thousand dollars or fifteen thousand dollars a month on on LinkedIn and they don't have maybe they have the pixel. Um, yeah. That would be step one. You want the LinkedIn insights tag installed on your website. And it's just, you know, like the Facebook pixel or the Google tag. It lets you see the traffic that's coming to your website. And the, the greatest thing about these pixels is it sees all the traffic. So you could then segment and say, you know, I want to retarget all my website traffic um, with LinkedIn ads or preferably all my website traffic that had that still meets these criteria, position, title, seniority level company size, geography. So qualified website traffic, you could segment it. And then you could even put it into little buckets, 30 day website traffic, 90 day, 180 day. And you could have different ads that coincide with, you know, the different buckets. Um, and so I would say, yeah, have the, have your tracking in place, create your custom audiences so that they're collecting data and then get proper conversion tracking. Because the other huge thing I see is I would say, the vast, vast, vast majority of companies, even big global tech giants, um, they're they're tracking, you know, form fills and website visits. But the more the more down the funnel you can track, like if you can get call booking tracked inside of your LinkedIn ad console, that's a game changer because I can't tell you how many times I've seen, and it, it's kind of back to the Facebook thing, the algorithm optimizes for what you track. So if you're tracking form fills as your conversion, it's going to optimize to that. And it doesn't know that, you know, this, if campaign A has 10 form fills and only one booked call, it doesn't know about the booked call. Campaign B only had five form fills, but four booked calls. So if you're not tracking booked calls, it's going to optimize to campaign A and you're going to be leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, yeah. So yeah, if you can set up tracking for call booking and even tracking for confirmed purchases. And it's as simple as having those people hit a URL on your website. If you use Calendly, you can do a, a URL redirect on confirmation that sends them to a thank you page on your website. And maybe as part of your onboarding process for new clients, 
you have them visit a certain, you know, welcome page, or, or we use like a sales page, pay kickstart right. that forwards them to a purchase confirmed page on the website. So on all of our ad platforms, we can track all of those different parts of the funnel. Um, and because again, you don't know if they're just time wasters, booked calls, or if they're actually going to convert. So the further down the funnel you can track, the it's beautiful. Yeah, sound advice. It's something we see a heck of a lot as well. If we run, if we're taking over websites or Google ad campaigns or taking over SEO campaigns, like you say, some sites might be spending thousands a month, whether it's on ads, whether it's on SEO, LinkedIn ads, whatever. And then you realize you get under the bonnet of the website and they're not actually tracking anything. I've seen sites where they haven't tracked anything. It's like, well, how many leads is this producing per month? And what leads are those are then converting into one business? They're like, I'm not sure. The last developer didn't do it for us. So like you say, getting those analytics in place, installing the tracking codes on the back end of your site or getting your web developer to do it and then making sure you know exactly how many calls that's converting into or how many form fills or how many, like you say, Canonly or Chili Piper demo requests you're getting. And then from there, how many of those are then converting into closed one business so you can really understand what the business case, what the impact is for this to justify the spend. Um, long term is is so crucial just getting those basics into place so that's really sound advice so with that said let's get a bit actionable from the impactable man um <laughs> what are some basics when it comes to actually cracking on setting up a linkedin campaign we've got the foundations in place perhaps we're running ads perhaps we're running seo perhaps we've got a solid website that we know can kind of build trust attract our target audience and convert them into demo requests or whatever we want to do. What are some of the first steps to actually setting up a, a LinkedIn ads campaign? The, yeah, the initial, the initial step is identifying your target demographic. Um, so again, if you have other channels running, you, your business has been around a while, you, you have a better idea of who that is. That helps a lot. Creating the right search group, um, setting, setting up your conversion tracking and your, your pixels to make sure you can do the retargeting. That's huge. And then initially when you're, when you're setting up the, the ads, the whole goal is to get their attention. You put your ads in front of your target demographic, who's most likely to have a need, and then you're tracking to see who's interested. What we see, and most people actually do that pretty well. So I feel like that, that side doesn't need the most attention. The biggest thing that I think within LinkedIn ads that people don't do properly is A, they either aren't retargeting, or B, right. if they are retargeting, they don't have any legitimate strategy behind it. Like I've seen, again, global tech companies who just move the move the ads that they're using from cold and then put those ads in front of the people as retargeting, which, you know, that overcomes the objection of maybe now is not the right time. Let's just stay in front of them. Okay, cool. It at least does that. But there's a whole plethora of other things that, you know, objections that you need to overcome that you can use retargeting for. So an actual strategy that hopes to build trust, um, you know, overcome the main frequently asked questions or objections they have that build credibility um, and show them like the, the range. So I think building trust and credibility um, yep. with retargeting is probably the secret sauce that 90% of companies are, are doing wrong. Yeah, let's drill down to this in a bit further and perhaps even give some examples maybe of your own company or other client campaigns that you've done, Justin, where perhaps you've used this specific ad with this kind of text or headline to a cold audience. And to be clear, a cold audience is going to be someone scrolling LinkedIn who's never ever seen or heard of your brand or your company before. So they're seeing it for the very first time. And then perhaps some ads that you've then retargeted with so we can kind of share the differences, how they work and kind of what they do to the, the prospect that's seeing them. Yeah, I would say for, for cold campaigns, your, your first goal is to get the attention of your, of your potential prospect. And usually what works well for a lot of companies is, I mean, if it's, if it's something that's well known, then a lot of times you, you just have to get on the radar and it could just be a branded piece of, you know, Hey, we're number one, well, web developers or whatever. Like you can honestly just say what you do, or you can hit the main pain point, like tired of, um, you know, your your LinkedIn ads company overcharging you or, um, or, or some unique thing that, that piques their interest. Like our, an example of a cold ad that we run is um, actually I use like an organic post of, of mine. I have two main cold ads that I run. I, one is um, it was like, kind of like a case study where it was like, Hey, this is how you run LinkedIn retargeting and LinkedIn retargeting is where you make all your money. 
Um, and I, and for a lot of people, that's kind of like a, oh, I wonder, you know, if our, if our LinkedIn retargeting like has a strategy or if, if we're not even running LinkedIn retargeting. And my second cold ad is literally, it just says like LinkedIn ad agency, I think, or LinkedIn white label ad agency. And it's just, this is what we do. If, if someone's curious about it um, or has been meaning to add on LinkedIn, you know, they'll check it out. And those are the only two like cold ads we run. But then in the retargeting, we run, we'll put, and I think of, you know, all the different people that you might follow on LinkedIn, especially like the demand gen um, type people who are getting a lot of is I think of paid ads as, as kind of a, a guaranteed form of delivery to, with content that you want to make sure certain people see. So I use it as a way of, so these are prospects who, who fit my criteria. They, I'm on their radar. They visited my site, but maybe they're visiting other competitors what can I put in front of them and show them that will tip the scales in our favor? So we put ads that don't necessarily always look like ads, case studies, um, client testimonials, client success stories, um, a press release, like your company in the news, awards you won. You can yep. put, you know, your team, you can put like ads that highlight who your team is, your backstory, your passion, like things that if, you know, basically a story you want to tell them, that should help separate you from the other pack. And, and it's different for every company. Um, so I would say those are the main ones that would fit the mold, but depending on what assets you have or as a company, what you think these prospects uh, should see. And in our case, you know, it's, uh, it is case studies, testimonials. Um, we also use a lot of tongue in cheek uh, because we're selling LinkedIn ads. I, I put ads that say, hey, this is a retargeting ad. Do you want to retarget your prospects as much as we're retargeting you? And we, you know, we use a variety of, of, um, of ads and formats to stay in front of them. And basically the idea is, yes, I want to do, do what you're doing to me, but for my prospects. Um, sure. So there's a way you can show them too, depending on what you do. So in terms of actually going for the conversion, so many B2B companies that run ads ultimately are going to want prospects to then book a demo or book a consult call or whatever that next step is that have us that brings on a sales conversation to eventually lead, yeah. lead to a one deal how early do we go in for the demo request or consult request should we be doing it from the cold ad or should we be running kind of cold ads to get click throughs to our website to then retarget and then prompt the demo or is there like a perfect piece where then we go for the the big ask and the demo request or the consult call request I, and I don't know if there's a there's a magic formula. The the biggest thing is each company kind of knows their sales cycle. Ours is fairly short. You know, if, if someone clicks, I think because of we're offering something that's well known, like LinkedIn ads isn't something that's new in the world, and neither is like what you guys do, SEO, web dev. And so if if they're if they're clicking and they're interested, um, then you know you can hammer them pretty hard probably in, in within ninety days. Um, a, a lot of other companies who have really long sales cycles might want to take a 180 day, you know, a six month approach, but yeah. layer it. But I would say I, I'm trying to think of my own campaign. I don't think I have very many ads where it goes in for the kill. Uh, my whole philosophy is kind of that demand gen philosophy where my, you know, if I targeted correctly, they're most likely to have a need. And then I do my retargeting strategy correctly, where I position myself as either the best option or the only option or one of the top contenders, if and when they do have a need, you know, I all of my ads don't have a book a book a demo, fill out this form. It basically sends them back to the website um, because once they feel comfortable and they want to move forward, they go back to the website and they book the call from there, um, and and that that converts pretty well. And I would say, and again, this is probably something that a lot of huge companies do poorly because they're focused on generating leads so yep. they they put form fills and lead generation forms in front of prospects on the cold layer which is really terrible because in my mind they haven't even visited your website yet they don't know you and then even the ad you're putting in front of them doesn't expose them to your website and your and your your brand so i i like to send the cold traffic to the website because until they actually see your see your brand get to know you a little more like your chances of converting are really slim and they and then these big companies like, okay, well, if we can't have a form fill, we're going to send them to this siloed landing page that's just a digital form fill that looks nothing like our website, that doesn't link to the website. And I'm like, that's just as bad because like 
at least like make it look like it's part of the website, have links to the website so it, yeah. they can get exposed to the bigger brand. Cause it's that the whole object of the cold isn't to convert. It's to expose them to your brand, to show that they had some sign of interest and then you go to work and retargeting them. Um, but yeah, I, I just retarget them and I, I tell the story I want to tell and when they're ready, they, um, they come back and book the call that way. Got it. So you raise an interesting point and even if you've been on LinkedIn for a few hours or a few days, just like you say, you'll probably see some B2B companies saying, look, download our latest guide on 10 tips to do this or sign up for our webinar on the best way to attack XYZ. Um, And those are quick ways or fairly quick ways to get leads in the sense of emails, names and emails. But are we saying that that's probably a terrible idea? And in fact, we should go for the long game like we've just been discussing of driving people to our site and then retargeting them, showing the value we can bring to the table, why we're geared to helping their fix their kind of issues, their pain points, and then eventually going to kind of guide them on our site and getting that consult call or demo request rather than going for the marketing qualified leads, the easy, the easy wins, and then nurturing them with a, I don't know, a 20 email sequence or a sales rep <laughs> giving them a call. I would say there's a, there's a right way to do lead gen forms and a wrong way. If, if you're putting your checklist or an ebook in front of them, getting their email and then passing that to a sales rep to hound them, that's probably a bad route. Um, and a lot of startups who try to use the lead gens don't even have the email nurture sequence to even like work those leads properly that they're getting. They just think they look at these big companies and they think that's how everyone else is doing it. So they, they try to do it the same way. The, so I would say completely, no, you shouldn't do lead gen forms cold, get them exposed to your brand. And if you're going to use a lead gen form in retargeting, don't consider that a lead and pass it to your sales team. Do uh, the right way to do it would be to have an email nurturing sequence that actually continues to add value. Like that isn't just a checklist and then, you know, pass it off. It's actual, you know, insights and position yourself as an expert, basically another way to like nurture them. Cause one of the things I've been playing with too is retargeting a retargeting campaign that seeks to like cross promote your other communities. Um, okay. So I just, I, I, you know, they visited my website, they knew who I am. Let's have a campaign that, you know, tries to push our, our, our newsletter that shows them our YouTube channel that shows them the podcast. A, I think that builds trust and credibility because they see, you know, we are experts, we're sharing our opinion here. But then B, if they actually subscribe or join any of those communities, then we can organically nurture them over time. Um, and if email is one of those ways, like you have a, a newsletter that does that, then I think that's that's a legitimate way to push. Um, but yeah, not the, not the old school way for sure. Yeah, I suppose it's quite, uh, looking at it from a different angle, So if someone's tuning into this and thinking, oh, that sounds all well and good, but I know the LinkedIn cost per click is pretty high. And if I'm sending them to a YouTube channel or a podcast or like you said, email subscription, is that just a bit of hope in the sense that they'll hopefully get some value from this piece of media, YouTube, podcast, whatever. And then six months down the line, eight months down the line, when they actually need your solution or they maybe know a friend that needs your solution or a contact in their in organization then in the hope that your organi- your company comes to mind because you've given them that value and then they go to you is that what the is that what the players were going for here um i would i would say two things i would say there is it it i guess it depends on individual buyers so if they are ready to buy and they visited your website and they already view you well then they will join those communities, digest your information at a quicker rate. And I think it will speed up the buyer journey for them where they you solidify in their mind that you are the expert and they're more comfortable with buying. And then there's the buyers who aren't ready to buy. They do like you. They, they, they click with your brand. They join your community. So in that case, your, your content would just kind of organically nurture them, stay in front of them. So that way longer than probably paid ads and way cheaper. Um, cause I, I do think, I do think community building is, is currently, you know, something that it's a hot topic people, right now. It's yeah, a bit of a buzzword. It's, it's, it's not a quick win, but I do believe that it, 
is something that people should be investing in. It's it's hard to get started. It takes consistency, strategy, but I, I do believe in it. So using paid ad, retargeting ads to build and cross promote your communities, I do think is a is a decent strategy that people can try. It's almost like risk mitigation, right? So it's it's like I often talk about on the podcast and on LinkedIn. If you're chucking all your money into one or two marketing channels, if one yeah. of those marketing channels takes a hit, your business is screwed. So if you're, for example, if you're only doing Google ads and that's like 100% of where your revenue comes from, if Google change the goalposts or ban your industry, or likewise, if you're perhaps only posting on Instagram or if Instagram make it pay to play, you're literally screwed. Um, your businesses could go under in 24 hours. Whereas like you say, setting up communities, whether that's kind of running a podcast, running an email list, then having LinkedIn ads, having Google ads, having SEO, having your website, you've got six, seven channels. So if one of them crashes overnight, you've got five or six other channels to kick in to continue yeah. to build your audience. Keep like how, in. like if LinkedIn uh, sends you a legal cease and desist letter and tells you that you need to change your name from LinkedIn Learn because it infringes on their <laughs> copyright of LinkedIn Learning and you sell similar products. That happened to us. They seized our, they sent us the official letter. We had to change our name. They seized our LinkedIn company page, our LinkedIn ads account. And that hurt because we had tens of thousands of dollars of spend. We had a nice retargeting audience that was producing 40 booked calls a month. And then we had to rebuild. And it and that made me realize how hard it is and how expensive it is to build LinkedIn from scratch because we had to start over. And even knowing the exact target, the exact copy, the exact graphics, the exact strategy playbook that produces positive, it still took us three to four months and $20,000 worth of spend probably to get back to where, you know, last month we booked 38 yeah. calls from LinkedIn and we're on track to book 50 calls from LinkedIn, but geez, it was brutal um, to rebuild. And then you realize there's a whole bunch of other stuff at play, like how many companies. So yeah, if, if, uh, if you can diversify your portfolio, if you will, of marketing channels, um, that's, and I, I think, I think community is a big one for that. And the other thing is most people, when they re remarket, it's like a 90 day, usually drop off window. And then after that, you know, they fall off, um, they fall off forever. But if in that 90 day window, you got them to join one of your other communities, you can nurture them organically for free, essentially, um, indefinitely. And I always say this too, like, I, you know, I run a paid ads agency, but I don't hate on organic because paid ads is X amount of dollar for X amount of clicks that should optimize to X amount of conversions, but it's a formula and it's finite. Whereas organic gains momentum every single month, X amount of spend actually gets X plus whatever you've already accumulated and it grows every month. So it's, it's worth investing in that way. Yeah. I mean, this conversation for me is almost endless because then I'd say also <laughs> to also to think about your website and like you say, it's only like yeah. 5% at best, you're going to get a conversion rate. So it's 95% yeah. of all your traffic probably won't ever convert. So if you can, like we were talking about, Justin, if you can have some useful resources, whether that's yeah. video guides, podcasts, actual guides, maybe you've got a lead magnet that's really, really valuable to your target audience. So they get their email and get them on your list. Um, all these kinds of bits and pieces just to keep people engaged so when they eventually do need your help, then you're the one that comes to mind. Just to give you that little edge on your competitors um, because marketing's not easy. Not everything works for every company, like you say, <laughs> and it can be a lot of money to get the right strategy. So just reducing your risk with those kind of things is, is smart. But, um, before we wrap things up, Justin, any other big no-nos, any other big things to avoid when it comes to LinkedIn ads or anything tragic that you've seen before that people should avoid? Um. I mean, like you said, there's marketing is marketing is complex and nothing is in a silo by itself. So you, you really have to have a holistic picture of marketing. So even though, yes, I run a LinkedIn ads agency, I will be the first to tell you to look at your other channels, look, invest in Google ads, SEO, organic communities, look at the quality of your website, because ultimately, I mean, LinkedIn, if you're, if your website isn't converting um, you know, the, the best quality traffic in the world that you send there is going to be wasted. Sometimes the best thing you can do with the extra budget you have isn't pour 10,000 more dollars into LinkedIn. It's try to improve the conversion rate of your landing page by 1%. You know, that's a huge dramatic effect. So look, look at the whole, the whole picture, you know, your target demographic, the creatives you're using, 
the the sources that you're getting to your website, how you retarget, the story you tell, the actual website in your process, and um, and yeah, make informed decisions with with the whole picture. And, and I, I really would love for people to stop putting stuff in such silos and comparing this to that, and instead asking how can this work together, how can this piece improve that piece. I think it's a much better intelligent conversation to have about marketing. Nice one, sir. And with that, I want to thank you very much for coming on the show, sharing your expertise around LinkedIn ads. Justin, please do tell us more about how everyone can tuning in, can learn from yourself, get in touch with your company and anything else you'd like to share. Uh, yes. So you can go to impactable.com. Um, like I said, we do run a LinkedIn ads agency. That is our primary core focus. We also dabble in LinkedIn outreach, which was the, the core thing we we're founded on. I do have a podcast, um, the Impactable podcast that just goes over uh, LinkedIn ads advice. We do have a YouTube channel, but probably not going to push that. It's not anything exciting yet. Um, and of course, I'm on LinkedIn, Justin Rowe, uh, founder and CMO of Impactable. I post, um, back to posting daily. So it's probably a decent one to follow for LinkedIn ad, marketing in general, startup life and like leadership topics. Nice one, sir. We'll put all of those links over at the show notes at businessgrowth.marketing. And with that, I want to thank you once again. Cheers, Justin. Awesome. Thank you. No worries. And as always, if you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to give us a rating on your podcast channel or click subscribe on YouTube. It's very, very much appreciated. And with that, we should catch you on the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>